If you've, uh, if you've been reading your program carefully, you'll notice that this slot was uh, designated for Paul Spence. Um, Paul sends his apologies. He had to rush home to, uh, uh, for a family emergency back in Canada. And uh, he did this last Thursday, and uh, it means we've been scrambling to, to find some material for you. So a lot of what I've talk I'm talking about today in this, in this first lecture uh, actually comes from a lecture given by Stephanie Waterman in the analogous uh, winter school exactly six years ago. A couple of things I've updated, but you know, actually not, not a huge amount has changed since then. Um, and, and Stephanie gave me access to all those slides, so uh, I'll, um, I'll be talking you through some of, some of those. There's a little bit more detail on here than I would normally have put on, so I'm going to skip through a few things. But if there's something you see on a slide that you want to know more about, just stop me and I, I'm happy to go back. Uh, and I'm also very happy for you to interject and wave your arm and, and stop me as I'm going. In fact, I quite like that. Um, OK, so a brief introduction to modelling the ocean. Let's start with, with what an ocean model is. And this will probably have some elements in, in similarity to what Todd talked about yesterday for the atmosphere. But as you know, an ocean model is some representation of the ocean. Okay? For example, here is a model of the ocean. This is my conceptual model of the ocean. This is how I think uh, the ocean works. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this conceptual model in a moment. But in general, when we're talking about ocean models, we need to be quantitative, okay? So we need to have some form of equations beneath what we're talking about, and we'll normally uh, have a set of equations that are sufficiently complicated that we need to solve them numerically uh, on a computer. Uh, and I like to think of models as describing physical processes, okay? And it's the physical processes that we're, we're going to talk about today uh, which are important. Note that uh, ocean models can also have uh, biogeochemical components, which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, and if you're interested in uh, carbon cycle and things like um, nutrient cycles, uh, the analogous side of the, of the land carbon cycle in the ocean, then, then you need these uh, biophysical processes. But today I'm basically going to talk about uh, physical models. So the physical processes we care about are how the ocean exchanges energy, momentum, etc., uh, with the atmosphere uh, and also with the Earth beneath it. Um, how the ocean moves, the dynamics of it, uh, and how we have processes that are acting at smaller scales, for example, turbulence, mixing, all those sorts of things that we care about. Just like, uh, just like a land model, there's a huge range of scales that we have to model to get the ocean right. And I would love to be able to model uh, things right down, maybe not at the molecular scale, but I'd love to be able to model at the Kolmogorov scale, if you know what that is. That's, that's, think of that as roughly about a millimetre. Um, and that's about the smallest scale of turbulence, ranging right up to ocean basins. And if we could model all those things, uh, all those scales in one model, we'd, we'd have a really good model. But the fact is we just cannot do that computationally. OK, so what that means is that models are constructed differently for different purposes. OK, so you can set up a hierarchy of models and there's some models that are conceptual or process models that, that don't have a lot of detail. They might focus on one particular thing. Uh, you have right up to global climate models, which are kitchen sink models, and they try and integrate everything all together. And you have everything in between. And this, the point of this diagram is that you can vary in the details, you can vary in the number of processes you're representing, and you can vary in how long you're going to run the model for. And depending on the questions you're asking, um, you'll be in a different space in that uh, three-dimensional uh, parameter space. And um, I, I guess in a, in a climate centre of excellence, we're often thinking about models as being uh, useful for future climate scenarios. 
but they actually do a lot of other things. Uh, in the ocean, we like to make forecasts, uh, state estimates, predictions, reanalyses, um, and these are the <coughs> operational uses of climate models. I personally have spent a lot of my career using ocean models to look at processes, okay, where I will set up a model specifically just to investigate one process and um, and in that sense the model might be very idealised or it might be very simplified but it'll do very well at one particular process and I'll try and understand that process. And we can also use it to interpret uh, ocean observations. Okay, So there's, there's a wide range of uses and what that means is that depending on your interest and what you want to do with your model, uh, you will set the model up differently. And, and just to note, uh, it's always good to remember this when someone criticises your model, particularly if you have a, let's say, an idealised model. I used to have, a, I used to have this model which was called a quasi-geostrophic model and I wrote it myself, I was quite proud of it. And every time I submitted a paper uh, with the quasi-geostrophic model, I'd say, oh, get a reviewer's comment saying, oh, you can't, you know, quasi-geostrophic models are too old, There's, you can't get anything new out of them. And so I had a stock phrase that I would reply to for reviewers, which was that, okay, if, if I didn't use a quasi-geostrophic model, I couldn't have resolved these processes because the model would still be running, okay? So, so it's, it's important to remember all models are wrong, okay? If they were exactly right, they wouldn't be models, they would be reality, okay? All models are wrong, uh, some are useful if you use them in the right way, okay? Right, so let's... Let's have a look at a model. Uh, some of you may have seen this before. This is um, a simulation we did. Well, this is hopefully going to be a simulation that we did a little while ago. I might have to go to the movie itself if Keynote won't play it for me. Um, let's do that, hey? I have to search it. Okay. We'll look at here. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, it, it's important for me to show you what models can do at the upper end. So, so this is from one of our highest resolution models. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in my second lecture today. And uh, what you're seeing is you're seeing the sea surface temperature. This kind of smudgy stuff is sea ice, uh, which is often incorporated or coupled with uh, a, an ocean model. And this is actually the velocity at the sea surface. And... Uh, we're going to peel back that um, uh, surface and what we're looking at here is a particular isopycnal, that is a surface of constant density and I've picked quite a dense surface so this dense surface is uh, and again I'm showing these colours are showing the uh, velocity okay so what you can see you can see a lot of detail okay you can see a lot of processes going on you can see these flows interacting with this topography that looks rather jagged, much like that map there on the wall because we've really exaggerated the vertical. Um, and we, we're going to scoot around to the other side here um, and peel some more layers back. And I guess I, th there's a couple of reasons for showing you this. One is to show you how rich the ocean system is, okay, dynamically. Um, and... And the other is to show you the sort of upper end of, of what we can do with a model. Um, of course, once you get to this resolution, there's no guarantee that everything is correct. Um, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how we know the models are doing well. Um, and I guess I also wanted to get a, a little bit across the point about how the ocean, uh, how we think of the ocean as being stratified, how we have these layers of density and you can see that this particular layer I've chosen here sort of comes up right up to the surface um, and these green lines here are, are my density layers in my conceptual model of the ocean. 
And, and again, we're, we're going to lay back some isopycnals here and you can kind of see how it migrates up through the water column in this particular region. Um, you see these things called eddies in, in isopycnal space. They look like little hills or bumps, um, but they're actually little circular rings when you look at them from the surface. And a lot of them are, can be felt right to the bottom of the ocean, okay, right down to 4,000 metres depth. And, uh, and we'll just show you a couple more of those before we move on. Um, and by the way, this sort of jitter that you see, uh, that's actually because obviously I've sped the, the movie up quite a bit and that jitter is actually the high frequency wind forcing, uh, the synoptic wind forcing that's coming across the ocean. Okay? And so you can see that these atmospheric processes are going much faster and you can see that uh, they're also, well, maybe you can't see it from this, but they're also much larger in scale, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. Okay, there we go. I can go back to Keynote, hopefully. Uh, no, not you. You. Okay, all right. So let's go into a little bit more detail, and I'm going to start by talking... Uh, how ocean models differ from atmospheric models. And the reason for that is, A, there's probably a number of you here who are working with atmospheric models, but B, uh, you just heard from Todd yesterday on atmospheric models, so now you know everything there is to know on atmospheric models. And uh, after that, I'm going to look in a little bit into the kind of principles or the fundamentals of ocean models. I'll show you a few equations. You don't really have to understand them, but it's, it's important to know they're there. And then I'm going to move on to sort of practicalities of ocean models. And there's a couple of things that I want to stress there. So I might skip some slides unless you stop me. Okay. Any questions before I start on this? Everyone happy? Some smiles. You must be happy. Okay. All right. So obviously the big difference between a, uh, the ocean and the atmosphere is we have a liquid instead of a gas. And so air is compressible whereas the ocean is very, very nearly incompressible, okay? And that means that we need a different way to solve things. In the atmosphere, you have an ideal gas law, which is to some extent easy. In the ocean, we have an equation of state, which is a function of temperature, salinity and pressure, and in some senses this is harder to model than the atmosphere. In, I guess mainly I'd say that it's different. Um, so in many of the applications that I use for ocean models, I basically assume that water is incompressible. Okay? And what that means is that if, if I've got a grid which is set up to house my ocean model and I push water in one side of a grid box, then something's got to come out somewhere else. Okay? So, so that's important. I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, if you like, you can, if you're used to thinking about the atmosphere, you can think of salinity... Uh, as being a little bit like humidity, okay? In that salinity basically changes the density of the, and, and the um, behaviour of the water um, and we have to account for the effects of salinity on density much the way that uh, you have to account for humidity in the atmosphere. The, the key thing about salt, though, is it's very, very conserved, okay? So when we integrate over our whole ocean model, well, the ocean sea ice system, salt really doesn't change, okay? It's, it's pretty much set. So uh, that sort of helps us a little bit. What it means, though, is that when we, um, when we solve for the evolution of the model, we don't solve for the evolution of density, okay? We solve for the evolution of temperature and salinity, and then we calculate density through an equation of state, and I'll show you that in a moment, too. There's also a big difference in the vertical structure of the ocean and atmosphere models. Um, this is showing a profile of in situ temperature. I probably would have preferred something showing potential temperature, if you know what that is. I can answer questions if you want to ask them. Um, so throughout the troposphere, you have uh, roughly constant potential temperature or de decreasing in situ temperature. Both the ocean and the atmosphere have a a fairly uh, well-defined mixed layer or boundary layer, okay? And then the ocean has this strongly stratified region uh, beneath the mixed layer called the thermocline, and it goes down into deep water. 
So this stratification means that just dynamically the ocean behaves a little bit more like the stratosphere than, than the atmosphere. And um, it means that because it's stratified, if you pull up a dense piece of water, it wants to just drop back down to where it was. And so what that means is that it's much easier in the ocean to move horizontally than it is to move vertically. And that's one of the reasons I pre-drew this diagram for you here, is because if you're sitting somewhere here in the, in the middle of the ocean, uh, you can find it very, there's almost no energetic cost to moving horizontally, but there's a big energetic cost to moving across these isopycnals. Okay? And so uh, in, in accounting for that, I often think of the ocean as being a series of, of layers uh, stacked on top of each other of different density. Yeah? Is there a Uh, yeah, there is actually. So, you remember that video I showed you that had, um, I showed you some regions around Antarctica and the isopycnals in the Southern Ocean actually slope right up to the surface and they, they outcrop at the surface or into the mixed layer if you like. This, this red thing is what I'm talking about, is a mixed layer. Think of a mixed layer of ha if having uh, no stratification in other words, your isopycnals are completely vertical in the, in the mixed layer. Okay? And so uh, isopycnals actually outcrop in the Southern Ocean and the densest water in the whole uh, ocean system is formed on the continental shelf around Antarctica. Okay? This tiny region of continental shelf around Antarctica is where you form the densest water. And because the densest water just wants to sink, okay, that water sinks down and it fills up the ocean from the bottom. And what that means is about half the volume of the ocean is this class of water we call Antarctic bottom water. So half the volume of the ocean uh, last touched the surface in these continental shelves, this, this tiny little continental shelf area. Yeah. And that's just because the shelf is cooling water, is that right? There's two processes going on there. So one is that it's, uh, it's, the water's pretty cold. Okay, uh, usually negative, sub-zero. And the other is that it's forming sea ice. And it turns out that the sea ice formation is the most important. And what, when you form sea ice, uh, basically what you do is you expel most of the salt. Not all of it, uh, but about six-sevenths of the salt gets pushed out of the ice when you form it. Okay, And when that happens, you're making the surrounding water which is already cold, you're making it much saltier. And so then it's not only cold, as cold as anywhere in the ocean, but it's also more salty. And so the, that particular class of water, uh, oceanographers love their acronyms, it's called dense shelf water or DSW. Some people call it HSSW, high salinity shelf water. Uh, and, um, and, and that's what makes it so dense. Now the same, the same, you can also get salty water at the equator thanks to evaporation and you can get salty water in the Arctic thanks to the same processes going on in the Antarctic, but it, it's not as cold and it's not as dense. So it can't sink right down to the, to the levels of Antarctic bottom water. Happy? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but the difference between non soft or um, I have no idea, but... Uh, from my picture in my head, I think that the North Pole there's more more area building of sea ice than in the South Pole. It was my my feeling. Is this correct? Or, because if there's more sea ice building in the North Pole, then there would be more salt in the water, and that would be in the end of the South Pole. Okay. Uh, right. So, firstly, um, there might be more sea ice volume in the north, but it varies less. Okay, so roughly speaking, I think there's about eight to ten thousand kilometres squared of sea ice in the northern hemisphere, and it, it varies seasonally, but not a huge amount. And and at least in the olden days, before climate change, you got a lot of uh, multi-year sea ice. 
Multi-year sea ice is very thick, uh, maybe up to four or five metres thick, and uh, it's had a few years to grow. Okay? And so you, you form sea ice in various places around the Arctic, and then it gets pushed all together, and, and even in the summer you still have large regions that, are, that are, have sea ice at the moment still. In the southern hemisphere, the, um, the annual range goes from around... I'm picking these numbers out of my memory, so they may be wrong. Don't write them down. Uh, you, you have a summer uh, sea ice area of about 4,000 kilometres squared, and in the winter that gets up to about 20,000 kilometres squared. So you have massive variation. Okay? And because of that big variation, that means each year you're forming a lot of sea ice. And it's, it's not the amount of sea ice, it's actually the formation of sea ice where the salt is expelled, okay? Now, it actually gets even, even more important, than, more nuanced than that. So let's take this little region here, and I'm going to draw up a, a blow-up. So this is my continental shelf around Antarctica, okay? This is the surface here. There's lots of bits of sea ice floating on it, okay? And... Um, the point is that up here you have Antarctica, which has these strong, cold, catabatic winds flowing off Antarctica. And catabatic winds do two things. Firstly, they push the sea ice away from the coast so, um, so that you form these things called polynias. And the second thing is that... Uh, there's a lot of heat exchange between the ocean and the atmosphere because the catabatic winds are very cold and very strong. Okay? And if it forms a polynia, then there's no, um, then there's no uh, sea ice to s slow down the exchange of heat between the ocean and atmosphere. So you get really high heat fluxes here, and some people call these polynias, right, where there's no ice, they call them sea ice factories because they're just making sea ice the whole time. And every time they make sea ice, it sits on the surface up there, because it's, it's, not, it's not as dense as the salty water, and gets pushed offshore. Okay? So you're continually making this sea ice all winter and forming this big pool of dense water here, which sort of stores up its density and flows over the edge eventually. Okay? So... Uh, that's a long-winded answer for a short question. But, um, but the, the key thing is that it's not just the amount of sea ice, it's really its formation. OK. Um, the other difference between the ocean and the atmosphere is its horizontal structure. Basically, ocean basins have walls at the side, and whereas the atmosphere has... Uh, Pretty much, you can you have a little bit of topography in the bottom, but it doesn't stick very far up into it, if you like. And what this means is that uh, we can't really use spectral models for the ocean. I think Todd talked about spectral models yesterday. Yeah, we can't really use them for the ocean. So, so we're always using finite volume or finite difference. Um, and this is a slide which shows a grid that we often use. It's called a tripole grid, where you you um, you stick your poles at, in a regular longitude latitude grid. Uh, you, you always need a pole, and in the poles, uh, you basically have a singularity. So we don't like them in the ocean, but we can put them under land. But only if we have the right pole, if you like. So what we actually do is we have a tripole. We have two, one pole in the in the south, and we have two poles in the north. And then there's clever mathematical ways to stitch them together. And finally, there's the time and length scales of motion. Um, I, I won't spend much time on this other to say that uh, the, the scales that we care about in the ocean are these, uh, these sort of scales of uh, eddies and fronts, baroclinic instability. These are all processes that occur in the atmosphere. But in the, ocean, in the atmosphere, they occur on sort of 1,000-kilometre time scales, uh, space scales, uh, and weekly timescales. And in the ocean, they're smaller. They're kind of 10 to 100 kilometres, but uh, they're actually um, slower. So they occur on sort of monthly or longer timescales. And in fact, the, the water down here... So 
say, there in the North Pacific, that water has probably been sitting there for about a thousand years at any one time. So to actually equilibrate the ocean, you have to literally spin it up for thousands of years. Okay? And that's a real challenge for us. Okay? So ocean modelers have it hard and easy compared with atmospheric modelers. Um, it's incompressible, mostly. It's strongly stratified, so we can take shortcuts in the equations that emphasise the horizontal nature. Um, and we don't have to worry about evaporation and, and convective APE, but we do have a little bit of ice to worry about. But we have a really complex geometry. Uh, bathymetry really matters in the ocean. Uh, we don't even know what the ocean looks like everywhere underneath the surface. Um, eddies are smaller, spin-up time is longer, and there's less observations to validate it by. So, um, pros and cons. Any questions before I move on to a few equations? Okay. So, I, I don't expect you to necessarily... Uh, assimilate all these equations into your understanding, but I do want to just quickly go through them. If you looked carefully at Todd's lecture yesterday, you'll actually recognise a lot of these equations because at least the horizontal momentum equation is pretty much the same uh, for the ocean and the atmosphere, uh, where I've used this DDT as a total time derivative, so that's the, that's got advection and local rate of change in. Um, but the vertical... Uh, advection in the ocean, we can cheat because we can use hydrostatic balance and we don't have to worry about vertical advection because of this strongly stratified nature of the ocean. We need some sort of conservation of mass equation, uh, often some, somewhat simpler than this. And importantly, we need to conserve salinity and temperature independently of each other. Okay? So we think of salinity and temperature there's two traces that we shift around and we diffuse and we add bits and bobs in at the surface and what have you. Uh, and we carry them around independently. And then, to get this density that we need to calculate pressure, we use an equation of state. Uh, and this is a nonlinear equation of state, which, uh, which uh, some people spend their whole lives trying to figure out exactly how they how this works. So we really end up with this set of equations where we've got seven coupled partial differential equations and seven unknowns, and in principle we can solve this. And this differs from, for example, land modelling, where in land modelling uh, the system is so complex, depends on biology, depends on vegetation, that you don't have a fundamental law that you can fall back on. Okay. But in the, in the ocean, we, we at least have the advantage that if we could solve this set of equations, we'd be very confident in the answer they'd give us. But it's, it's just not possible to solve this at a resolution uh, that, we, that we want. Okay. So that's the challenge, if you like. The other things we need in an ocean model, we need some boundary conditions. We need to know what a basin looks like. We need to know what the topography looks like. Uh, we need an atmosphere on top to exchange with, which gives us the forcing, short wave radiation, long wave radiation, all those sorts of things. Evaporation, precipitation, uh, runoff from the land surface, uh, etc. And sometimes we'll also include tides. Okay? And finally, we need an initial condition. And the initial condition could be something we've assimilated, it could be, uh, it could be something from climatology. It could be something from another model or another simulation. And basically, if we have the... In fact, when I initialise my model, I'll, I'll usually give it zero velocity and I'll just give it the temperature and salinity and I'll allow it to spin up from there. Okay? And with all those things in place, we can, in principle, uh, solve for our ocean model. Okay. So... Next, I want to talk about a few practicalities. Um, I want to talk about uh, grids, horizontal and vertical, and I want to talk about uh, parameterizations and, and how we actually solve these. So let's, let's start with 
the horizontal grid. And I mentioned before that oceanic models can't really cope with uh, spectral techniques. So we're usually solving these models as finite volume uh, techniques, if you, if you know what they are. But basically it means we need a way of chopping our globe up into little boxes. Okay. Um, unfortunately, we're on a sphere, so that introduces some problems. And so any grid that we have will basically be curvilinear and, they, and they'll be, the grids will be close to but not always exactly orthogonal. Okay. Also, a regular grid like this will converge at the poles. Okay. And that's, that's an advantage actually for us because we often find that processes are smaller in scale at the poles and we want more grid resolution. But when we have more grid resolution, we, we have problems because uh, we have to take a smaller time step uh, and it costs us more. And if we get really small grids, say in the Arctic, then what we find is that the time step is set by the Arctic and if we don't care about the Arctic uh, for, for the model, modelling task we're doing, then we're wasting a lot of, uh, a lot of computational power. Okay? So what we often do and, and what we do in... Um, in our access IM2 model, which I'm going to talk about more today, is we make a tripolar grid. This is the tripole. Um, basically, we have two other poles at 65 north, and you can see that um, in this region, our grid lines curve around. Okay, they're still fairly close to square in the ocean parts. Okay, because we don't have to start resolving ocean until here, um, but they're the, the grids are smaller, particularly around here. And this is a problem because it can be a problem. What we found when we went to uh, higher and higher resolution is we started resolving all these embayments that come in through Russia and come actually really close to our tripole. So we started getting some really, really small grids, like 500 metres or something, which, which uh, we just couldn't cope with. Um, so in the end, we filled in a few Russian embayments and, and rivers. Um, did a bit of uh, um, a bit of uh, uh, bulldozer work, if you like. Um, so, a horizontal grid like this, or a tripolar grid, um, are efficient uh, and they're easy to solve. But um, what they mean is. In a regular grid, you've got the same resolution everywhere, and you don't always need the same resolution everywhere. Quite often, we want to resolve bathymetry around the coastlines. But in a regular grid, if you want to resolve the bathymetry around the coastlines, you have to increase the resolution everywhere. Okay? Whereas, if we use some of these really cool techniques, uh, such as irregular grids, you see everything here is a triangle. Okay? Um, and this is a finite element model, um, and you can see it does a fantastic job of getting the coastlines right. No zigzagging coastlines, but that comes at a real cost, actually. It comes at a computational cost, because solving things on a triangle is just harder. Um, it's really hard to configure. It's really hard to analyse. Okay? Quite often in the ocean, we want to only integrate things or you know, integrate across the basin, but... How do you only integrate across here? You've got a whole lot of different size elements. So, so there's a lot of challenges to do with, um, with this sort of modelling. And the other thing is, uh, for, for large-scale oceanography, what we often care about is we often care about uh, ocean eddies. And ocean eddies are, give or take, similar size over the whole globe, and they occur everywhere. So we need to, we need to resolve them everywhere. So uh, I don't actually use... Uh, any uh, irregular grid like this, but I'd, I'd very much like to. The other thing is, a lot of the parameterizations we use, which I'm going to hopefully get up to before I finish, um, have resolution-dependent physics. You need different coefficients depending on the resolution, and here you're finding resolution varies everywhere, so you'd need different parameterizations. Unless you have a very clever parameterization which is scale-aware and, and independent of the, of the grid scale, which we don't have. <coughs> okay. So, that's the horizontal grid. Um, and, in, you know, the summary of this is that most models use some sort of tripolar grid like this to, to get around our problems. 
And the vertical grid is much more interesting, and this is something that I've, I've been working on a little bit lately. So we have a few options for our vertical grid. Uh, one option is that uh, we use basically Z levels, okay? And, and this is the traditional approach. One is that we use a sort of terrain following approach. And this is great because what it means is that you is that you can resolve bathymetry much better and it's really good for coastal modelling, okay? But there's a couple of problems with this uh, and one of them is that if you go across your grid cell, you find that you're moving a lot vertically. And because water's so heavy, if you move a lot vertically, you get a big pressure gradient across the cell just from the cell being in a different vertical position and that can produce really big errors. They're called pressure gradient errors. Okay, with, with uh, these sorts of grids. The other thing is that you can see that as the symmetry comes up, all the layers squish because it's terrain following, and that's a good thing because that's what you're after with this. But you can imagine if you come from 4,000 metres out here to, uh, well, the ocean doesn't have vertical walls. It, it goes gradually to zero what you basically do is you have to set a minimum depth of about 100 metres, otherwise you have all your grids all stacked all together and you can't have that, okay? So you can't really do right up to the coastline with this, this technique as much. Uh, another strategy, instead of having fixed levels, is to allow your levels to vary, okay? And in this case I'm showing an example where the grid is following isopycnals. So that's that pretty much, pretty much means it's following these isopycnals right through the ocean interior. And this is a huge advantage because, uh, because it means that you can get this horizontal movement along isopycnals for free and you don't have any of the problems that these grids give you. Okay? So if we... If, but then we've got a problem here. Okay? And the main problem is that these uh, isopycnal models uh, really don't know what to do at the surface because at the surface you have a mixed layer where there's no stratification. And if there's no stratification, then your, coordinates, your vertical coordinate is, disappears. Okay? So each of these have their advantages. None of them is a complete solution. Um, The, the complete solution that I think we're going to go to is a new type of grid called arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian. And if you've ever heard of a model called MOM6, this is what we use in MOM6. And it's, uh, it's a model that we're hopefully moving towards here in Australia. And basically this is a configurable hybrid system. And it allows us to use some sort of Z level near the surface. It allows us to use some sort of terrain following near the bottom. And in between we can have some sort of isopycnal interior, okay? And the way it does this, oh, I, I scribbled something on the slide there, but it's, it's not very useful, so I'll, I'll try and explain it. We think of the ocean as a series of layers like this, and then we just time-step these layers as if it were an isopycnal model. And when we do that, what we find is that you might have a region where there's convergence or divergence. And so at the end of our time step, and our time step is purely horizontal, um, then you might have this layer bulging. And then at the end of that time step, we can choose what to do with that bulge. We can either just leave it, and that's what you would do in an isopycnal model. You would just leave it, okay? The layers would get thicker and thinner, and, and no one would have a problem with that. Or you could introduce a vertical velocity, or a dire surface velocity, uh, across there to get rid of some mass here and take it into the neighbouring layer and, and associated with that is a little bit of mixing, okay? But mixing of water between these two isopycnal layers. And if you, if you pick just the right amount of vertical flux, then your layer returns back to where it was originally. And so then, then it would be like a Z-level model, okay? Or you can have anything in between. You can relax it slowly back towards the Z-level you can relax it to, towards something which is uh, more terrain following, and so on. Yeah? So, in that case, uh, there would be a, like a water mass function? Yeah, so 
so the way um, the way you would frame this is actually as a water mass transformation. Okay, so. Uh, Uh, very carefully. Um, so, so one way to think of these vertical velocities is that this, if you didn't have, um, if you had a z-level model, this would just be happening all the time. And so, when you when you do this, you have a um, you have an associated numerical diffusivity that comes about from mixing water across this interface. Okay. Really, what you're doing is you're choosing to do that in a much more controlled way. You're choosing to do that, that numerical diffusivity in a much more controlled way, and it, and it turns out to be much cleaner. Um, you, you can still have water mass transformations explicit in the equations as well. Okay, so you can do that as well, but uh, but you have, what you have here is really your dire surface velocity um, that that means water is shifted from one grid to the other and associated that with that is a little bit of inevitable um, diffusion. So, uh, so, so can you just ask, can you just the same water mass class? Yeah, you can. In fact, I'd say you're, you're much better at preserving your water mass classes in this system because throughout the bulk of the ocean, you can use something that is pretty much just layered. And in the layered system, you can actually get zero numerical diffusivity because all your... Um, all your velocities are along layer. So in principle, you could get it to zero. In practice, that's pretty hard. But I'd say it does a much better job. We know it does a much better job than, than Z-level. So. But it's new, and we haven't quite figured it out uh, completely yet. So. OK, I'm running out of time. I could talk a little bit about model resolution. I might talk about that more in uh, my second lecture today. So let's skip over those. And actually, um, let me just move forward to this one. Let's see if this movie works. Because this is, this is going to show you a little bit about resolution. And the other thing I wanted to talk to you about briefly was parameterizations. I think I'm going to skip that because I don't think we have time for that. So instead, um, I'll, I'll stop at the end of this movie and leave some time for questions. Um, so this is a movie we made actually a number of years ago now. And it is a study we're doing in a regional, with a regional model southwest of Australia. And this is just showing the, well, that was the sea surface temperature. This is the sea surface uh, velocity or speed, if you like. And this little uh, island here is Kaguelan Island uh, in the south, very south Indian Ocean. And um, you can see how dynamic and rich the uh, environment is here. This is a 1 20th degree resolution. Um, and it's, it's finer than the cutting edge climate model, OK? So what we did with this study is we took a little region in the middle here and in this region in the middle we, because uh, that's where we're interested, it's where a lot of the turbulence was, in that region in the middle we actually upped the resolution by a factor of four, okay? And when we did that, we found uh, a whole lot of new stuff arising, okay? So we're going to zoom in and have a look down here and as soon as we switch it back on, you can actually sort of see where our box is. You can see a line here, okay? And so this is like a, uh, there's a line over here somewhere. Um, this is like a, a nested high resolution model and we're getting things up to uh, an 80th of a degree, okay? And, and it, this was sort of significant because it was the first time anyone had modelled at this scale in the Southern Ocean. Um, and what you can see is that more scales <coughs> pop out, okay? So you're getting smaller and smaller scales popping out and I can guarantee you if we went to another uh, factor of four in the resolution, we would see even more scales, okay? So even this resolution out here is not something we can do with global climate models. So, um, so this is a fairly long way off for global climate models. Um, and 
uh, we're, we're, we're working on it. So for any model which uses uh, coarser resolution than this, all these processes have to be parameterized. So that includes the parameterization of these sort of larger scale eddies, which I've showed you a couple of times, and the parameterization for that, which I would have showed you if, if I hadn't spoken so slowly early on, um, is called the Jen McWilliams parameterization. And then at these smaller scales, you have submesa scales which are parameterized. And at even smaller scales than that, you have internal waves and, and turbulence which uh, are very effective at, at mixing of water across isopycnals, okay, and transforming water between different isopycnal classes, okay. All of those things are really important, uh, and they're the things that we have to parameterise uh, in our ocean models. And I'd, I'd say that's probably where the where the cutting edge is. So I'm not going to show you anything about those. Uh, I'm going to finish with uh, a challenge for you all, and and that is that what we really want is uh, an ocean climate model which can resolve eddies and topography, has no numerical diffusion, uh, is efficient so we can integrate it for millennia and spin the whole ocean up. And uh, there's a lot of challenges um, to get to that point and uh, we're probably not going to get there in my lifetime so, you know, there's plenty of work for, for you all to do on, on ocean models and there's some ideas on what you might want to do. Uh, down below. Thank you. So you're asking, did the parameterizations perform poorly, or did so they? When, when you ran much higher resolutions, well, they were all they were wrong, but all models are wrong, so we're okay with that. Um, so what we learned from that was that. Um, particularly in the regime of the Southern Ocean, is that a really important thing that emerges at that fine scale is you have a lot more vertical velocities, okay? And those vertical velocities are very fine scale and they're missed by the larger model. And so that didn't matter so much for generating the right stratification or the right water masses, but it really mattered for the, for the nutrients and the biogeochemistry um, because... Uh, it could bring nutrients up more effectively. And so that, that was the whole point of that paper. Um, in general, I'd say uh, when, you, when you model any of these processes at high resolution, you always find out that the parameterizations are imperfect. They always are. And, and they have to be, right? That's just life. Um, and so improving those parameterizations is is one of the most pressing things because we're not going to be able to afford to run eddy resolving models for a long time. It's, it's just not practical. So we, we still need the... Even though we can run high resolution models now, we still need the parameterizations and we need them to be better. And, and I think that's, that was our target in that, was to really understand uh, how, how it could be improved. There was a question here. Then. Uh, I still get very clear about the arbitrary vertical coding. Can you explain it again? Okay, I can. Okay, so um, so it's called arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian. And let me explain what I mean by a Lagrangian vertical coordinate. What I mean by a Lagrangian vertical coordinate is if I start with a, with a layer or an interface dividing two layers and over the course of the time step that, uh, that layer thickens or thins, that has some variation, then it's been shifted by the fluid flow, so that would be a Lagrangian process, would be deforming the interface, okay? And an example of this is called a shallow water model. Do you know what a shallow water model is? Okay, so a shallow water model, you have literally a series of stacked layers and all you have is horizontal velocities. 
And if you have convergence, the layers thicken. If you have divergence, the layers thin. Okay. So that is that's a perfectly acceptable way to run an ocean model to use an entirely Lagrangian coordinate. Okay. But it doesn't work at the surface, and it doesn't work at the bottom. Okay. So another way to do it is to allow your surfaces to, to deform during the dynamical time step and then after that dynamical time step is finished to then apply a new grid. So what you do is you go through this process which we call regridding, remapping. First you say, which grid do I want to be on in the vertical? Just in one dimension. Okay? So it's, it's not regridding re everywhere, it's just in the vertical. Do I, you know, my layer that started off like this, do I want to let it float around or do I want to keep it fixed? Well, if I'm near the surface, I want it to keep it fixed. If I'm at depth, I want to do something different. Okay? So that's, that's the first thing. Once I've decided my new, my new grid, then I remap everything in a conservative way by having these... And, and the way I remap is actually by um, pushing water up and down uh, across these layer interfaces. Okay? And, and then I can go on again. Now, the, do you know what CFL is? Did Todd explain CFL yesterday? Anyone know what CFL is? Yes, what's CFL? Yeah. So you can't have velocities which pull something fluid from one side of the grid box to the other in a time step. That's, you, your time steps are too long. And in a lot of ocean models where we're trying to get the vertical processes right, the time step is limited by the vertical CFL, the, how fast the vertical velocities are. Now, in ALE, you don't have a vertical time step, so you don't have vertical CFL. So as far as the vertical component is concerned, you can take as long time steps as you want. And in fact, you're only limited by the horizontal CFL, which is a really big advantage as well. So it's just, uh, in the initial state, it's use the uh, fill-grain uh, organic to decide into the surface. Then just uh, uh, in every time step, it was decided the vertical structure. Uh, you, you could, the initial state can be anything you want. Okay. And between each time step, you can change it to anything you want. So here's a, here's a really good one. Why, it's called Z tilde. And Z, in Z tilde, you want to keep your layers level, but if there's, a, if there's a thickening of the layer, then instead of pushing it straight back on a time step, you might say, well, I'm just going to push it slowly back over the course of two weeks. And what that means is, that if an eddy comes in for a week and then disappears again, or if internal waves are propagating through there, then the, on that time scale, the interfaces just deform and let it through. But on longer time scales, then it will relax back towards a, a certain level. So that's, that's called Z tilde. Um, yeah. Yeah. I imagine that could be quite expensive computationally. Are there ways that you can get around that, or is it you just have to be careful about one that you're doing? Um, so there are ways you can get around it, and it does depend on the question you're asking. I mean, if you care about the tropical mix layer, you can get away with spinning up for 10 years. Okay? If you care about the kinetic energy of eddies in the Southern Ocean, you can get away with spinning up for 30 years. But if you care about these deep water masses, you're, you're a thousand years. And if, if you care about the carbon content of those deep water masses, it's another order of magnitude beyond that, um, actually, because the, then the carbon cycle has to equilibrate as well. So it really depends what question you're asking. The way we normally get around it is we accept that the model is going to have some drift associated with, it, with its spin-up. So we give it an initial condition, which is as good as we can possibly make it, and then we accept that there's some slow drift. And then the questions we ask will be like, well, what happens if the wind stress changes? Okay? We give it a big kick and we see what, how the system changes. But instead of 
instead of just looking at uh, the new state, we look at the different... We, we run our... So we've got our spin up. We spin it up for a while, but there's a steady drift. And then we change something here. And instead of just looking at the new state and what that does, we look at the difference between the new state and the reference run. Okay? So that's a pertinent question because you're going to be doing that this afternoon in your lab. So remember that, that uh, idea.